Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 31 Houses have their own ways of dying, falling as variously as the generations of men, some with a tragic roar, some quietly, but to an afterlife in the city of ghosts, while from others, and thus was the death of Wickham Place, the spirit slips before the body perishes. It had decayed in the spring, disintegrating the girls more than they knew, and causing either to accost unfamiliar regions. By September it was a corpse, void of emotion, and scarcely hallowed by the memories of thirty years of happiness. Through its round-topped doorway passed furniture and pictures and books, until the last room was gutted and the last van had rumbled away. It stood for a week or two longer, open-eyed, as if astonished at its own emptiness. Then it fell. Navvies came and spilt it back into the grey. With their muscles and their beery good temper, they were not the worst of undertakers for a house which had always been human, and had not mistaken culture for an end. The furniture, with a few exceptions, went down into Hertfordshire, Mr. Wilcox having most kindly offered Howard's End as a warehouse. Mr. Bryce had died abroad, an unsatisfactory affair, and as there seemed little guarantee that the rent would be paid regularly, he cancelled the agreement, and resumed possession himself. Until he relet the house, the Schlegels were welcome to stack their furniture in the garage and lower rooms. Margaret demurred, but Tibby accepted the offer gladly. It saved him from coming to any decision about the future. The plate and the more valuable pictures found a safer home in London, but the bulk of the things went countryways, and were entrusted to the guardianship of Miss Avery. Shortly before the move, our hero and heroine were married. They have weathered the storm, and may reasonably expect peace. To have no illusions, and yet to love, what stronger surety can a woman find? She had seen her husband's past as well as his heart. She knew her own heart with a thoroughness that commonplace people believe impossible. The heart of Mrs. Wilcox was alone hidden, and perhaps it is superstitious to speculate on the feelings of the dead. They were married quietly, really quietly, for as the day approached she refused to go through another Oniton. Her brother gave her away, her aunt, who was out of health, presided over a few colourless refreshments. The Wilcoxes were represented by Charles, who witnessed the marriage settlement, and by Mr. Cahill. Paul did send a cablegram. In a few minutes, and without the aid of music, the clergyman made the man and wife, and soon the glass shade had fallen that cuts off married couples from the world. She, a monogamist, regretted the cessation of some of life's innocent odours. He, whose instincts were polygamous, felt morally braced by the change, and less liable to the temptations that had assailed him in the past. They spent their honeymoon near Innsbruck. Henry knew of a reliable hotel there, and Margaret hoped for a meeting with her sister. In this she was disappointed. As they came south, Helen retreated over the Brenner, and wrote an unsatisfactory postcard from the shores of the Lake of Garda, saying that her plans were uncertain, and had better be ignored. Evidently she disliked meeting Henry. Two months are surely enough to accustom an outsider to a situation which a wife has accepted in two days, and Margaret had again to regret her sister's lack of self-control. In a long letter she pointed out the need of charity in sexual matters, so little is known about them. It is hard enough for those who are personally touched to judge. Then how futile must be the verdict of society! I don't say there is no standard, for that would destroy morality, only that there can be no standard until our impulses are classified and better understood. Helen thanked her for her kind letter, rather a curious reply. She moved south again and spoke of wintering in Naples. Mr. Wilcox was not sorry that the meeting failed. Helen left him time to grow skin over his wound. There were still moments when it pained him. Had he only known that Margaret was awaiting him, Margaret, so lively and intelligent, and yet so submissive, he would have kept himself worthier of her. Incapable of grouping the past, he confused the episode of Jackie with another episode that had taken place in the days of his bachelorhood. The two made one crop of wild oats, for which he was heartily sorry, and he could not see that those oats are of a darker stock which are rooted in another's dishonour. 
Unchastity and infidelity were as confused to him as to the Middle Ages, his only moral teacher. Ruth, poor old Ruth, did not enter into his calculations at all, for poor old Ruth had never found him out. His affection for his present wife grew steadily. Her cleverness gave him no trouble, and indeed he liked to see her reading poetry or something about social questions. It distinguished her from the wives of other men. He had only to call, and she clapped the book up and was ready to do what he wished. Then they would argue so jollily, and once or twice she had him in quite a tight corner, but as soon as he grew really serious she gave in. Man is for war, woman for the recreation of the warrior, but he does not dislike it if she makes a show of fight. She cannot win in a real battle, having no muscles, only nerves. Nerves make her jump out of a moving motor-car, or refuse to be married fashionably. The warrior may well allow her to triumph on such occasions. They move not the imperishable plinth of things that touch his peace. Margaret had a bad attack of these nerves during the honeymoon. He told her, casually as was his habit, that Oniton Grange was let. She showed her annoyance, and asked rather crossly why she had not been consulted. "'I didn't want to bother you,' he replied. "'Besides, I have only heard for certain this morning.' "'Where are we to live?' said Margaret, trying to laugh. "'I loved the place extraordinarily. "'Don't you believe in having a permanent home, Henry?' He assured her that she misunderstood him. It is home life that distinguishes us from the foreigner. But he did not believe in a damp home. "'This is news. I never heard till this minute that Oniton was damp.' "'My dear girl,' he flung out his hand, "'have you eyes? Have you a skin?' How could it be anything but damp in such a situation? In the first place, the Grange is on clay, and built where the castle moat must have been. Then there's that detestable little river, steaming all night like a kettle. Feel the cellar walls. Look up under the eaves. Ask Sir James or any one. Those Shropshire valleys are notorious. The only possible place for a house in Shropshire is on a hill. But for my part, I think the country is too far from London— and the scenery nothing special. Margaret could not resist saying, "'Why did you go there, then?' "'I—because—' He drew his head back and grew rather angry. "'Why have we come to the Tyrol, if it comes to that? One might go on asking such questions indefinitely.' One might, but he was only gaining time for a plausible answer. Out it came, and he believed it as soon as it was spoken. "'The truth is—' I took Oniton on account of Evie. Don't let this go any further. Certainly not. I shouldn't like her to know that she nearly let me in for a very bad bargain. No sooner did I sign the agreement than she got engaged. Poor little girl! She was so keen on it all, and wouldn't even wait to make proper inquiries about the shooting. Afraid it would get snapped up, just like all of your sex. Well, no harm's done. She has had her country wedding, and I have got rid of my house to some fellows who are starting a preparatory school. Where shall we live, then, Henry? I should enjoy living somewhere. I have not yet decided. What about Norfolk? Margaret was silent. Marriage had not saved her from the sense of flux. London was but a foretaste of this nomadic civilization which is altering human nature so profoundly— and throws upon personal relations a stress greater than they have ever borne before. Under cosmopolitanism, if it comes, we shall receive no help from the earth. Trees and meadows and mountains will only be a spectacle, and the binding force that they once exercised on character must be entrusted to love alone. May love be equal to the task. "'It is now what?' continued Henry. "'Nearly October. Let us camp for the winter at Ducie Street.' and look out for something in the spring. If possible, something permanent. I can't be as young as I was, for these alterations don't suit me. But, my dear, which would you rather have, alterations or rheumatism? I see your point, said Margaret, getting up. If Oniton is really damp, it is impossible, and must be inhabited by little boys. Only in the spring let us look before we leap— I will take warning by Evie, and not hurry you. Remember that you have a free hand this time. These endless moves must be bad for the furniture, and are certainly expensive. 
What a practical little woman it is. What's it been reading? Theo, Theo, how much? Theosophy. So Ducey Street was her first fate, a pleasant enough fate. The house, being only a little larger than Wickham Place, trained her for the immense establishment that was promised in the spring. They were frequently away, but at home life ran fairly regularly. In the morning Henry went to the business, and his sandwich, a relic this of some prehistoric craving, was always cut by her own hand. He did not rely upon the sandwich for lunch, but liked to have it by him in case he grew hungry at eleven. When he had gone, there was the house to look after, and the servants to humanize, and several kettles of Helen's to keep on the boil. Her conscience pricked her a little about the basts. She was not sorry to have lost sight of them. No doubt Leonard was worth helping, but being Henry's wife, she preferred to help someone else. As for theatres and discussion societies, they attracted her less and less. She began to miss new movements, and to spend her spare time re-reading or thinking, rather to the concern of her Chelsea friends. They attributed the change to her marriage, and perhaps some deep instinct did warn her not to travel further from her husband than was inevitable. Yet the main cause lay deeper still. She had outgrown stimulants, and was passing from words to things. It was doubtless a pity not to keep up with Vedekind or John, but some closing of the gates is inevitable after thirty, if the mind itself is to become a creative power. End of chapter 31